All right. Welcome to the inaugural edition of the KO Corner. Uh, before we get started with everything, I did want to give a quick shout out to uh, Team Left Jab Boxing, the Boxing Network. Appreciate them for providing us with the opportunity and with the outlet to discuss boxing and voice our perspectives about the sport of boxing because it truly is something that we we love. Uh, this channel, this station, this podcast is going to be about everything boxing, whether it's upcoming fights and the breakdown and, and analysis and prediction of fights, um, upcoming events. We're going to discuss in detail different fighters and their styles, different trainers, uh, promoters, promotional companies. We're going to get into fans and the particular fan base of certain fighters. We're going to discuss pound for pound rankings, divisional rankings. We're going to discuss old school fighters, new school fighters, prospect fighters, women fighters, um, champions, amateurs, professionals, all that good stuff. And essentially, this is just the unique perspectives that are offered through the eyes of a fighter, through the eyes of an educated fan, and just an overall appreciator of the sweet science. So with that, you know, at some point, during our upcoming shows, we're going to have different promoters, fighters, um, other trainers, other reporters, um, even just listeners, just to offer their perspectives on these fights. Because, again, we want to express and digest and discuss all the different perspectives revolving around the sport of boxing. You know, we want to have an open mind and we want to discuss varying viewpoints. So that's the main thing. And um, this is the KO Corner. I'm one of the representatives. My name is Kirk Jackson. I'm a boxing writer, reporter. I have some amateur experience fighting. I was able to win a national title. You know, so I do have some uh, interesting perspectives regarding the sport of boxing. Also in the KO Corner, we have our fellow brother, Rich. He's a fighter as well. We have TC. He's another fighter. They won't be here with us tonight, but they will definitely be on future shows. And also, we have one of the, one of the other members of the KO Corner, Abraham, and he can give you his information and let you know what his experience are with boxing. Yeah, um, just boxing has been part of my life <clears throat> since I was very young. Um, you know, whether it was me watching it or, or um, actually getting in the ring, you know, it all started with uh, Mike Tyson. That was, that's my, uh, that's, that's the time where I realized, okay, I, I love this stuff. What, what is this? I need more of it. And so, yeah, um, you can keep going, um, Kurt. Well, what yeah. do we have to do? What, what, what do we have on the, the agenda today? Okay, so what we have on the agenda is we want to discuss Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury negotiations as it sounds pretty close to being finalized. We also are going to discuss uh, the Mikey Garcia situation with Errol Spence, see how far along they are with their negotiation and if it is really a reality of happening or if uh, Mikey Garcia will end up fighting another opponent for his next fight. Also want to discuss his pound for pound status to see where he ranks pound for pound wise. And, um, you know, a few other things we're going to discuss HBO and the, the sudden decline with that network being as they used to be the premier uh, network when it came to boxing. We also want to discuss um, Showtime and we want to discuss Eddie Hearn and the app that he has as he has some scheduled events that are coming up pretty shortly. But the main thing that I want to discuss and get into right now, which we can lead off with, is what happened over the weekend with Sergey Kovalev. For those who do not know, Sergey Kovalev is one of the main forces and factors at light heavyweight for the past several years. And um, aside from losing to Andre Ward a few times, he you know, was pretty much thought of as the main guy. And even in defeat against Andre Ward, he's still highly regarded. But his ass got knocked the fuck out <laughs> over the weekend. So <laughs> let's get into that. Uh, what did you think about that fight? Uh, good fight between two top light heavyweights. Uh, what more could you ask for? 
just back and forth. Uh, um, before Kovalev got stopped, it looked like he was, you know, he was given to Alvarez. He he seemed to uh, he he started be uh, start. He was able to uh, take away his jab for for a little bit there. Um, I know Alvarez started off strong with it. First couple rounds, you know, I was like, oh, man. It just quick, snappy jab. And so it, it took it took uh, Kovalev some time to get used to it, to to be able to, um, you know, make his adjustments, to counter it. And he started doing it. Um, and, you know, he – there was a moment there where I'm thinking, oh, man, okay, he might just – he might get Alvarez out of there. But Alvarez showed – composure and that's that's really big he that that's that's what it came down to was him showing composure not you know saying oh shit uh, uh, it's over for me you know like others have we we see it we've seen it in their eyes when they fought Kovalev once they take that one clean punch now it's it's like it shut shut them down mentally and physically they don't want anymore right but with Alvarez he fought through it he he like I said, he was composed. And um, I saw he made an adjustment where, um, like I said earlier, Kovalev started making those adjustments adjustments when it came to his jab, right? Instead of just dra- uh, jabbing, you know, in front of him, straight to his, you know, his head, whatever, right? He changed levels. Now he jabbed to Kovalev's stomach. So now Kovalev had to make that adjustment. Oh, shit, now you, you're going to jam me down there. Okay. And once Kovalev made that adjustment, or at least was aware of it, it seemed like Alvarez went back up. <laughs> right. And he didn't, he didn't even, like, he didn't really jab for real. It was, it was more of a... I guess probing jab somewhat, oh, right? Yeah. Stuck it out there. Right. Right? Exactly. Um, and he came, you know, he went with the, the straight right after that, following it. And um, Kovalev just didn't, he wasn't ready for it. Ate it. You know? It hurt him. It hurt him. I, I like your assessment with that because just to piggyback off that, I believe Kovalev, he mounted his offense off that fear factor. I mean, w- once he would land that good shot, you know, early to begin the fight, and he has a reputation of having tremendous punching power, I think fear would, would creep into the back of the mind of many of his opponents. And um, with Alvarez, we did not see that. You know, as you mentioned, he had uh, that that look of determination and I think that comes from just life experience. I mean, I believe he's what thirty-four years old, yeah, and yeah. he's seeking that world title, and he's undefeated. You know, twenty-four and zero, twelve knockouts now, and he just he has uh, been wanting this shot for a long time, uh, and he finally had that opportunity in front of him where he grasped it. And I think uh, just with his appearance, to me, and I was joking around with someone on Twitter. And I think I texted this message to you earlier that um, he looked like uh, Tito Trinidad when he fought when he fought Winky Wright. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if he summoned the strength or something of uh, Trinidad <laughs> and um, took that with him in his fight against Kovalev. But I think not being afraid, uh, mentally having that mindset to where I'm going to withstand whatever Kovalev throws at me, for one, is smart um, strategically and just overall for the fight. Now, as far as strategically, it's not going to, you know, that alone won't help you in the fight. You still have to make the adjustments and you got to throw the shots. So as you mentioned also, he changed levels. So even if he doesn't land anything from changing levels, I mean, he would he, he would land some shots, but even if he doesn't land anything, he's given Kovalev that look, which makes Kovalev react. So when you do yeah. that, you can, you can set off your attack from there. And, I believe the round he knocked Kovalev out, and I think early to start that round, I want to say within the first minute, he landed a pretty good body shot on Kovalev, and Kovalev kind of like winced a little bit. 
and he didn't land anything significant until he ended up knocking him down the first time. But I think that initial shot, you know, set the wheels in motion for that knockout. And I know we've discussed this earlier, but not on the show, which we'll do now and bring it up. But uh, I believe he studied a lot of what Andre Ward did in those two previous fights for where maybe he would not mimic the same movement that Andre did or Andre Ward had, but it was the same game plan as far as giving Kovalev different looks and not allowing Kovalev to set sit down with his jab because he kept having to reset based off those different looks that Alvarez was giving to him. Yeah. Yeah, I've been, uh, you know, it seemed like he... <laughs> He really understood what he saw in the in the film, his film study of uh, the, you know the two ward fights, two ward uh, Kovalev fights. You know, um, got to give it up to his his uh, his manager, his advisor, his promoter, because in my opinion, a year ago, I don't think he was ready for the fight. Two years ago, he wasn't ready. Even when, you know, the, the Alvarez, the version of him that knocked out Lucien Boutte, uh, I remember he had a couple fights. Uh, I want to say he had a fight on Spike TV against somebody, you know, no one of, you know, of name, whatever. Those versions, no way in hell would I said, oh, well, that guy's going to KO Kovla. No. I don't think he was ready back then. But I think, you know, Timing is everything. When it when it's uh when you're ready, you're ready. When when you're if if you're the people looking out for you, if if you know they're really doing a good job and you you're getting experience, you're you're fighting the different different types of fighters, the different styles and everything. Um Sometimes it's just your time. It's your time. And I think that's what it is with him. It's just, it's his time to shine. He was ready. The the mama wasn't too big for him. That that was another thing that was crazy is okay, yeah. Earlier I said composure. But he had, that was that was the biggest fight of his career. Right? He's fighting Kovalev. He's not fighting some other guy that some unknown guy. No, he was fighting Kovalev. And the moment didn't get too big. You didn't, you didn't hear him freaking out in the corner. You didn't hear his trainers freaking out. Everybody was ready. So it was, it was great timing on their, you know, on their behalf, whatever. And um, it, it worked out. Now he is the man. You know? Yeah. He has a belt. Um. Uh, he has a lot of options. The ball's in his court. He can do whatever he wants now. He can say, well, obviously Ko- Kovalev has a rematch clause, so that may happen in December. But also, let's say it doesn't. Now he has he has options. He can go fight Dimitri Bivol. That's a fight that the world wants to see. That you know, that's everyone's gonna tune in for that. That's a, that's a great fight. Two champions. Uh, also. He can go the other route and fight, maybe try to fight Adonis Stevenson. Or that, that's still an option, even if he fights, you know, Bivol. Let's say he's able to beat Bivol. Now you have two belts. Uh, let's say Adonis Stevenson is able to beat his mandatory. Now you guys can meet in a big fight in Canada. They're both from, this, I think, the same area, Montreal. That's a huge fight. So, well, he, you know, he's sitting pretty right now. And that route you mentioned is probably the route he wants to take, being as Adonis Stevenson is over 40 years old. Um, by the time that fight happens, if uh, Alvarez is able to go through Bivol first, then or, or take the Kovalev rematch, or whichever route he decides to do, whether it's the Kovalev rematch, if he's able to win, if he goes through Bivol, is able to win, and then ends up fighting Stevenson, that'll be, what, another year at least? If that happens in another year, Stevenson is older. If he's able yeah. to maintain his um, his title, being as he had a, a life or death match with Badu Jack, so 
Um, that'll be interesting to watch. Another thing, though, is if Kovalev and Alvarez have a rematch, it'll be interesting to see how Kovalev, what his mindset is entering the rematch. You know, in, in light of his defeats against Andre Ward, on each occasion he had a list of excuses where ultimately at the end of the day, the responsibility is within the fighter himself. The fighter, you know, the trainer can't fight for the fighter. The fans can't fight for the fighter. The writers can't fight for the fighter. And although there may be a list of excuses that are valid, it doesn't matter when you're the world champion. You still have to go out there and perform. And that's the testament of a truly great fighter. Not to say anything bad about Kovalev, but it's just interesting to see what his mindset will be if that rematch occurs. And one thing he definitely needs to do, which is the biggest mistake I saw in that fight, is when he got knocked down the first and second time, he did not try and clinch. Right. He tried to yeah. fight back. He tried moving around a little bit after the first knockdown and um, tried to, you know, regain his composure, but he should have clinched. He should have held. Yeah. And maybe that's uh, that comes down to experience. He's never been in a situation like that, right? Right, he's used to making the other guys wobble and do the the stanky legs. So yeah, it was a, a role reversal for sure. And man, I I do I do remember him getting knocked down uh, Hopkins. in a fight before mm-hmm. before he Hopkins. fought B Hop. Right, right before he fought Hopkins. But if that was kind of a a flash knockdown. Just, yeah, just him being off balance. Maybe like it wasn't he, he didn't take a hard shot or anything really. So. Um, he didn't really have to clinch in that situation. He got up. He's like, okay, all right. And then he went and got him out of there. Uh, the ward uh, knocked out. I mean, that it was it was over. So he had no no opportunity really, right? You you can tell with his body language. He he was looking for a way out. Yeah. He he looked um he, he you know he looked like he didn't want to want to fight, but you know. As you said, hopefully this is a learning experience for him. Yeah, um, hopefully, because I, I don't, I don't buy. And th- this is what I don't like about just uh, some of these commentators, networks, and even some of the fans. As much as okay, some of the controversy he's had in his career, whether it's been. The racial things, the the sexist things. All right, I understand that, but he's brought us a lot of entertaining fights as well, right? Um, I don't like how he loses, right? He loses to Andre Ward. Andre Ward was pound for pound number one in the world. You got to give a pass to somebody. If you lose. Uh, you're losing to the to greatness, right? right? It's not like you're losing to some dude that's 24 and 23 or something, right? Then then there's a problem with that, really. Then we're like, bro, you, you done? You might as well step away, man. You're you're losing to guys that you shouldn't be losing to. Okay, that's understandable, but like I said, you lost to Underwear twice. Then a, a leader Alvarez, top light heavy, you lose by KO, and a good fight, a, a fight where you could argue he was winning, right? The, I I want to say, from what I what I heard after the fight, the judges had him up, so this is a fight that you were winning. Well, and and to cut it really quick, I saw a tweet <laughs> where a user said uh, Harold Letterman still has Kovalev up, even even though the fight's over, and even he- with the knockouts. Yeah. With, the, with the knockdowns and the knock, <laughs> wow! <laughs> I, I just like his. Uh, what's the, what's the guy's name? Um, <laughs> Damn. The other guy, uh, with the hair, Max. the gray hair. No, not Max. The other one. Uh, I don't know why I can't remember his name. Um, who loves who loved Pacquiao? Oh, Jim Lampley. Jim. 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 I just I just love Cole style. He just keeps coming forward and he's just so aggressive. He cuts off the ring beautifully. Yep. <laughs> right? You don't have to throw no punches. If you come forward, he's gonna give you the round, it seemed like. <laughs> right. Yeah. All you gotta do is step forward and 
or you you can throw a thousand punches and and miss every single one, but you know you're throwing punches, so it, that yeah. that's that's uh, deemed as effective aggression. But yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's a whole other conversation for another <laughs> for another day. Yeah, but anyway, just going back. So he loses Alvarez. He uh, he was doing well. Um, I don't even, I really don't even agree with what the commentators are saying. I, f- I felt like uh, Alvarez, yeah, he was landing some, he was landing his jab. Okay, I'll give you that. He had a, a very, you know, fast, you know, snappy jab in there, you know, that was troubling. Kovalev, Kovalev was having a, you know, he was trying to figure out the timing on it, right? But still, at the same time, I feel like Kovalev was landing more shots. He was landing the better shots. Uh, and and then you saw it, you know, third, fourth, and on, whatever. You saw him really, you know, he's. I thought he was landing some some nice shots in there, and um, um, and then it just happened, right? Alvarez yeah. made his adjustments, and he was able to capitalize on them. Um, there's no, I I wouldn't. There, there's people, you know, that I saw were saying, oh, he got a lucky punch in. Nah, nah. I, Nah, he was setting it up. Um, you can see it coming. You can see what he was trying to do. If you really look, if you really look at the the, the film or whatever, you can see it. You know, and he, he's finally able to land it and got him out of there. But um, these are these are top guys. Kovalev is fighting the top of you know top competition. So I I I can't agree with someone saying, "Oh, he's done. He's thirty five years old." Roy Jones, I think he said that he's done. What? Well, nah, you don't I'll, don't say that. At least give give us some time, man. Give before you say something like that. Give us some time. Don't say it right away. That's crazy to me, man. Well, that makes like for the for the fighters. It makes like what do you think they? How how do you think they're gonna think? Shit, if I lose a couple times, I'm you gonna people are gonna jump ship. Might as well just keep fighting these these mid level guys or something. Oh. Is kind of like with what they do with Gennady Golovkin, um, which <laughs> which brings to the next topic with HBO. Like, our, so is HBO as a brand as far as for hosting uh, top notch boxing events and fights and having all the best fighters? Is their run over? Like, are are they declining? Because it seems like we can tell with how that network feels about a fighter based on the commentary. So when they're done with a fighter, you can hear a shift in commentary and it's like they, they treat that, that fighter, that, that once highly coveted fighter who was, you know, thought of as the pound for pound best and the greatest thing since sliced bread. And once HBO has a change of direction on their viewpoints of that fighter, as far as, what they want to do with them marketing wise, they'll dispose of them in the commentary. An example would be Roman Gonzalez. I mean, a few years ago, once Mayweather retired, Floyd Mayweather, uh, Roman Gonzalez was thought of as the number one pound for pound guy out of nowhere, just shot up to number one. You know, he's climbing through divisions and fighting all these guys in the lower weight classes and doing tremendous things. Don't get me wrong, but as far as pound for pound and what that should consist of he lacked in a few categories for um being labeled the top number one pound for pound guy and as soon as he lost to i don't want to butcher his name i want to say soren guy and i'm sorry if i'm mispronouncing his name the the fighter from thailand they they pretty much just said roma gonzalez was done he's done as a fighter and he's he's washed up and shot so they they actually disrespected Seringai and didn't give him his credit for beating Gonzalez and then they pretty much disposed of Gonzalez so do you do you think they're doing that with Kovalev and do you think HBO as a whole is just kind of on the downward decline um yeah I feel like they're doing that with Kovalev for sure I mean their comments prove that you know, right away, just he's done and he's 35 years old. Okay, okay, all right. But, um, yeah, he's 35, but I, I want to say it's, it's based off of 
uh, how many fights you've had and um, just all the the damage is done to your body. If you've been in a lot of wars, okay, 35 is very old for you, right? But Kovalev hasn't been in a lot of wars. He recently started getting to, you know, really tough fights, the two war fights and, and the Alvarez. That's recent. That's recent time. Before then, he's knocking out everyone quick or it's just domination. Um, and so I, I don't know. I, I would just like them to be respectful, give respect to Kovalev, give respect to Alvarez, and say what, it, what that was a hell of a fight. Applaud both of the fighters, and don't talk about this is the end of a road, end of the road for somebody. No, can we allow, uh, allow the everything to to settle, and then you can you know make those statements if you want. But right away, that's crazy to me. And then HBO. It seems like they're, you know, moving more and more away, you know, from boxing. We're, we're seeing less uh, events, um, a lot of one-sided events. How many pay-per-views do they, do they have this year? Is it just the Canelo, the Canelo and uh, Golovkin fight in September? I, I think so. I think that's only one. When has that ever <laughs> happened in HBO's history where – you know, there's only been one pay-per-view event. Yeah, it's uh, it's, it's rare, man. This doesn't happen. And you know, it just it, honestly, um, you know, you'll you'll have fans on one side, right? Let's say you're you just love PBC or Showtime, right? That's that's those are your guys. Um, you might. Be glad, you know what's what's happening to HBO. You might be glad that it's happening. Me, don't get me wrong. They they be on some bullshit sometimes, right? And the commentating might be not, you know, it might not be the best. You know, you shit. There's times where I turn it off. I'm like, you know what? Let me. Can I find a, a stream somewhere? You know, can I can I find? Let me go listen to the British commentators. Right, I just don't want to hear what they're saying anymore. But what is good for boxing? It's good for boxing to have HBO. It's good for boxing to have good fights on HBO, fights all the time. It's good for boxing to have that. It's good for boxing to have a lot of fights on Showtime, ESPN, all these networks. And the best fighting the best. That's what's good for boxing. So when I see HBO, what they're doing over there, and, it, you know, you have long periods of just no fights, and all of a sudden they pop up, you know, they have one card, and that's depressing. As a, as a, a true fan, I'm like, damn, what is this? Come on, HBO. This is, this is the HBO. This is HBO with all the history, all these great fights. This is equivalent of um, Monday Night Football not being Monday Night Football. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, just one Monday, there's there's a, a game, and then the next one, you know, you have two, three, four, fucking five Mondays in a row where you have no no uh, no games. You know what that would do to a a football fan, you're gonna be freaking out. Like, what, what, what's going on? I'm not used to this. This is, this doesn't happen, right? And so that's how I feel when I don't see any fights scheduled for HBO. I'm just like, man. Regardless of the politics and boxing, regardless of who I don't like, regardless of who's promoting on that channel, at the end of the day, what's good for boxing is that there's fights on that channel. And it's good, you know, the, the good fights, the, the best fight and the best. Uh, I will pay for a pay-per-view if it's top guys, you know? If, if it's uh, Terrence Crawford versus Pacquiao, I pay for that shit. That's a fight. Well, 
it, even when paying for that, what what we're really doing is paying for the funeral of Manny Pacquiao because he's been <laughs> he's getting annihilated in that fight. Um, yeah, but, you- but that <laughs> um, that's what we think would happen, that, right? That- but we know it's box; anything can happen. Styles make fights as well. Okay, so we've heard rumors of this fight happening ever since Mikey Garcia brought it up in his post-fight interview interviews. And um, it seems like day by day, this fantasy, this rumor is becoming more and more in reality. So what are your thoughts about potentially Mikey Garcia fighting Errol Spence? Do you think he can win that fight? Does he stand a chance? How does it look for him? Can the fight even happen? Uh, he has a very good chance of beating Errol Spence. I mean, uh, we've seen it. Uh, he's jumped up to all these different weight classes, and he's been able to beat, you know, high-level fighters. And so, he, you know, someone like that that has the skills, you know, it should translate to, you know, 140, maybe even, you know, probably even 147. But I – I, I think Errol Spence, though, uh, that's, that's a hard opponent. Errol's clicking. He, he has it going. You know, he has all the momentum. Uh, he's very skilled as well. If it, if, it, if it was somebody else, if it was Jesse Vargas at 147 or uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I know like Ugas, that Cuban cat. Uh, Maybe even Pacquiao, Danny Garcia. Those are good fights for Mikey that he may be able to win. But I think you know, he's the baddest man right now at 147, and it's, it's going to be a hard fight. I think he'll be competing. He'll be a competitive fight, but I think um, late Errol, you know, will really get to him and, you know, and get him out of there probably. Um, I, I, think, I, I think it's uh, – it can be made. It's, it's it's not something that is. It's not Mikey trying to use it, use Errol's name like publicity, or whatever publicity stunt. No, this is it, it's something real. He really wants to do it. Um, it it's very surprising. Like it came out of nowhere, right? And his dad, and his brother, his brother being Robert, you know, Garcia, his his trainer. Both don't want that fight for him. So that says something. So, also interesting is Mikey mentioned fighting Errol Spence last year when yeah. um, when when the world, the boxing world was, was fixated on the thoughts of Errol Spence and Keith Thurman finally a uh, meeting up and locking horns, being as, you know, Errol had uh, met the demands from from Keith Thurman as far as getting a title and establishing his own name. So it's kind of been building a little bit from Mikey's end. And, you know, ever since stating that, he's done nothing but win. He's, as you mentioned, you know, he's shown he can fight effectively at a higher weight class. He fought Adrian Broner, who was a bigger fighter. And we can argue that he can – beat some some of the welterweights that are currently fighting. I think, as you mentioned, he would bode well against Jesse Vargas. Jesse Vargas isn't really a big welterweight. And although he has, he is skilled in, in certain aspects, I think Mikey would give him a really good run. And the same can be said for Danny Garcia. I think he can, he can beat him. It's a possibility. It'd be a really, really competitive fight. Yeah. So, um, Lamont Peterson. I mean, Lamont Peterson, especially now. Amir Khan, you know. Oh, actually, I want that's one fight. Yeah, <laughs> I definitely want to see Amir Khan versus Mikey Garcia. That'd be crazy. The hand speed versus the the timing. Well, Amir Khan would win some early rounds, but uh, eventually, I think he gets caught and gets put to sleep. Possibly, but as long as it goes, it'll be a it'll be a classic fight. <laughs> It's a different, definitely. you know, the two styles. Yeah, definitely. 
And at this point in his career, Amir Khan's more experienced fighting at higher weight classes compared to Mikey. That's true. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Mikey, uh, he was supposed to meet with, um, I think, probably Showtime or who, whoever, you know. Uh, they, I just, according to Robert Garcia, his brother, he was saying he was meeting with somebody for the Errol Spence fight. So it's, it's looking like it's real and, you know, it should be becoming official soon. I even, uh, who was it? I was listening to uh, Dan at ESPN. He has his, you know, his boxing show. Uh, and he had um, Stephen Espinosa on. And Espinosa, the date, for that fight because they have the Deontay Wilder Tyson Fury fight, you know, that they want to put on pay-per-view and they want to put Mikey Garcia, Errol Spence on pay-per-view as well. So they got to make sure it's great timing for both of those fights. Meaning you don't have um, one fight coming up on set you know, this Saturday and then, then uh, another pay-per-view the following Saturday. You wouldn't have that. The fans are going to be like, what? They're going to have to pick and choose. Well, I'm not trying to pay that much for, you know, two weekends in a row. So um, Espinosa was try- was sounding like he was going to try to make it for October or early November. Um. So they got to, yeah, they, they, you know, we should be hearing some things pretty soon. Well, yeah, I think that that would be a great time frame. I believe Mikey in his post-fight interview after defeating Robert Easter mentioned he wanted to fight at some point in October or November. So that, that definitely falls in, in the frame, the time frame for what he's looking for. You know, he didn't take too much damage from – Robert Easter. Yeah. And, you know, still active. Errol Spence isn't too far removed from his last fight. So I think the timing definitely suits both guys. Yeah. Yeah. As you mentioned, definitely want to make sure that with those two proposed matchups with Mikey Garcia and Errol Spence and then uh, Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury, that for one, they're not stepping on each other's toes. So that you know, both matchups, all four fighters have time, have their time to shine and, uh, you know, get their proper attention. Yeah. And definitely want to be friendly to the fans and not hit them with back to back pay per views and, and hurt the pockets. You know, the, the, the goal is to grow the audience and, I'm I'm thinking they would put the Deontay Wilder fight and Tyson Fury fight after the Errol Spence Mikey Garcia fight. Yeah. I think just because as far as build up goes, the personalities of Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury, I mean, they're so entertaining. I mean the 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 press run, you know, if that, you know, goes into play, the press run the press run is more <laughs> entertaining than some actual fights. I mean, those guys are very charismatic and uh, it's a great matchup so hopefully we see both mm-hmm. yeah yeah i can't wait man it's gonna be exciting uh you know fall winter um and then uh, another Four. thing another thing that i heard was keith thurman one time is supposed to come back and possibly his comeback will be on the Tyson Fury Deontay Wilder pay review. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah, that's perfect. You have that pay per view. You have Keith Thurman there in attendance. They can, you know, ask or I'm sorry, him fighting. Uh, you can have the winner of Errol Spence and Mikey Garcia there in attendance. Maybe have some kind of build up. Mm-hmm. And you could have the winner. Porter Garcia. <laughs> there as well. right. <laughs> right. That's crazy. Exactly. <laughs> well, um, so things are shaping up nicely for Showtime and most importantly for the fans. Yeah. 
And another thing with the matchups, the proposed matchups with Mikey Garcia, Errol Spence, Deontay Water, Tyson Fury, all four fighters are undefeated. Mm-hmm. That's true. Yeah. That is true. So you're getting undefeated, high-level fighters fighting each other, you know? Um, and really both, you have Mikey and Tyson Fury that, um, you know, I say most people think they're biting off uh, too much. There's, you know, people that think Tyson Fury is not ready. You know, he needs, you know, a couple more fights. He needs to keep stepping up and then go into a Deontay Wilder fight. Well, shit, he wants it. You know, it's a championship. You know, lineal is on the line. WBC. Oh yeah, huge Pay fight. Pay per view fight. It, that's crazy. You know, that's hard to pass up. Yeah, and people have to realize Tyson Fury is bigger than Deontay, mm-hmm. as far as like stature. Yeah, and he's very as awkward and unorthodox as Deontay Wilder can be. The same can be said for Tyson Fury. That's true. You know, both guys are highly skilled uh, in spite of their, their, their contrasting styles. They're, they're both skilled, and it's going to be a really interesting match. I actually think Tyson Fury has a really good shot at beating Deontay. I do as well. Okay, so I wanted to finish the show with discussing the pound-for-pound pound list and seeing who's number one pound-for-pound pound and who's in the top ten. If you go across different media outlets, ESPN, I believe they have Gennady Golovkin listed as their number one. If not him, then Vasil Lomachenko. I think the Ring Magazine is the same. I'm pretty sure Jim Lampley and the HBO and the Fight Game probably have Gennady Golovkin or Lomachenko at number one, two, three, four, five, and six. And then they probably got them on the Gotti list or whatever. And that's not a knock on those fighters, but. I know there's certain narratives that these media outlets want to project, but as far as pound for pound, who you feel like is the best fighter out there, uh, who's your number one fighter, and who do you think belong in the top ten, or who's on the cusp of cracking that that top ten? Okay, uh, number one, uh, Terrence Bud Crawford. You know, um, Undisputed at 140. Um, what is he a two weight champion? Um, three, three, three weight champion. Yeah. Jesus. Yep. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. One third. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what more can you say? That's all you need to know. To be honest, beating top guys. You know, for his you know his weight class, any weight class he's in, he's beating the, the best guys available, and so. That's all you would ask for. Uh, and then Usyk, number two. We just saw him um, become an undisputed at uh, Cruiser and went on a hell of a run. Marco Hook. Um, I mean, Michael Hunter. And I know people are going to be like, Michael Hunter? No, I feel like Michael, Michael Hunter is underrated. Uh, he's, you know, 30 years old. Um, I think less than 20 fights, but if you look at him, the things he's doing, you know, Olympian, you know, he's a very good fighter. And I I think that was a hell of a victory for Usyk. Um, And Gaziev, we just saw him beat Gaziev in the final, made him look like he was nothing. So he's incredible. That that's, you know, that's power pound number two stuff for me. You know, if you, if you're doing things like that, um, number three, mm, maybe I don't want to butcher his name. SSR, <laughs> the guy from Thailand. Wrong guy. Wrong Him, him, hell of a fighter, man. Beat Roman twice. Knocked out Roman. 
you know, brutally just damn, just out. Um, and it was beating other top guys in in his division. And so the reason why I have him so high at three, okay, he's might not jumped up multiple divisions and became undisputed, but uh, he beat the guy that they were saying was pound for pound number one. Not only beat him, he's beat him twice and stopped him. So that that's, you know, that's amazing. Uh, and, you know, he has a crazy story, how he came up and everything. But um, you can put him at three, maybe four, just depending. Um, NUA, you can have him as high as three. Four. He's gone on a crazy run through multiple divisions, stopping people left and right. You know, is <laughs> this dude will jump in a weight class and first fight being a championship fight and, and stop that the champion, the, the number one guy at that weight in the first round. That I mean, who's doing that? <laughs> And then, you know, we're, we're blessed to uh, see him, you know, if everything works out, you know, uh, we're blessed to see him be in the World Boxing Super Series for his weight division. Which is a so very we, tournament that Usyk won. Yeah. So we could potentially see him become undisputed. And if he becomes undisputed, that just throws, I'll just throw my pound for pound list out the window. I don't know what to do. <laughs> You know, I I probably have to. Man, that's tough. I probably put him at two. Probably put him at two. Or my maybe even one. I I, uh, I hate to do that to Bud, but well, either way, two great fighters, one A, one B. Well, even with that, I think it depends on the trajectory because if he's in the tournament, more than likely, and if things you know, play out, he'll win the tournament and be unified and undisputed. So that's, that, that works in his favor. But with Crawford, you know, we don't know what may happen. Maybe he's able to get the the other block to come play with him, meaning Keith Thurman, Errol Spence, Danny Garcia, etc. With Terrence Crawford, he may maintain the number one spot. Uh, we were discussing with how Inouye may ascend higher to him on the pound-for-pound rankings just based on the performance of if he could potentially win that tournament in his weight class and unify the titles, becoming undisputed. And I was pretty much just saying that his trajectory towards number one pound-for-pound kind of depends on what Crawford does as well because Crawford at welterweight is in one of the hottest divisions right now. And although he plays on the other side of the block, so to speak, being as he's promoted by Top Rank and Bob Arum, while the the Danny Garcias, the Errol Spence, Mikey Garcia, um, all the other prominent welterweights like Keith Thurman, they're advised and running with Al Heyman with PBC and Showtime. So it may be difficult for those fights to happen for Terrence. And it's not because these guys are afraid of each other. They're all professionals. They're not afraid of one another. It's just that they're politics in the game. So his trajectory to maintain number one spot may depend on what can happen with negotiations and getting these fights, these high quality fights against the Danny Garcia's of the world. So if he is able to secure those fights and he's able to show out and show he is a true pound for pound number one guy and beat these guys, I don't think no matter what anyone else does, well, I don't think they can supplant him as a number one guy. I agree with all that stuff. You know, that's uh, that's definitely what's going on. Um, but we won't know until it all plays out. So yeah, that's true. And you know, you hope for the best. You hope that uh, you know these political barriers, you know, different networks, they'll come together and make these fights. It won't just be, you know, one, you know, arrow on one side of the road on one block, whatever, like they are saying on Twitter, going back and forth with each other. And him having to, you know, he's fighting all these guys and Terrence Crawford is fighting Jose Benavidez and, you know, some of these other 
guys that we don't, we know, you know, we're not really looking forward to, you know. Um, obviously, we're gonna we'd watch, you know, that's Bud Crawford. There's no more power five. You're gonna watch that, but it's like no one is giving Benavides a chance uh, now. If it was David, okay, <laughs> or Jose, it's like, you know, okay, bro. Um, and we we've seen this story before, also with Top Rank and their pound for pound fighters. You know, for for many years, they'd match up Manny Pacquiao with guys who were not really qualified to test him, whether it was guys that were coming off injuries or coming off bad performances or guys being weight drained, some type of stipulation. And it wasn't the best matchup. And we see the same thing with Vasil Lomachenko in some cases where he's fighting guys who are coming off long layoffs like Nicholas Walters or like uh, Gilmore Rigondeaux in the case where he moves up, what, two weight classes and he's coming off a year-long inactivity streak and his last fight prior to Lomachenko, the fight ended in a no contest. So it was like one round. So, I mean, you know, we don't want to see that because it's not fair to the opponent, but it's not fair to guys like Vasil Lomachenko because he is very talented. And I'm sure as that fighter, he's a competitor and wants to show that he's the best out there. So yeah. we definitely deserve better fights. That's true. And speaking of Lomachenko, um, I have him five or six on my pound for pound list. You know, you can um, maybe switch, you know, him and Mikey. Mikey, you know, is right there is with, with him as well. So they're either, you know, five or six. Guy, you know, two guys both jumping in weight, beating some of the best guys out there. Yeah. You have Mikey and Loma embarrassing these guys, going through these, you know, different weight divisions and, you know, they, they look, you know, the truth. They look like the truth. And speaking, saying the truth, right? Whose nickname mm-hmm. is that? That's Errol Spence. That's who Mikey's supposed to be fighting. Uh, if, if everything checks out, you know, and uh, we should see that in the next couple of weeks, um, that fight become an official. That's a huge fight. And that's that's huge for his pound for pound status as well. If, if I have my six right now, what does – him beating Errol Spence do <laughs> that shoots him up, right? Right. Oh. And oh, and I'm sorry to cut you off. Just to backtrack on a statement I said earlier about Terence Crawford and no one supplanting him. If Mikey Garcia can defeat Errol Spence, I have to retract and say that he's number one because that's ridiculous what he would be able to do if doing that. Yeah. Really, just that'd be amazing. Um, and then you know, seven, seven, eight, triple G, G um, Jared Hurd, Swift. You know, um, we know about Triple G, what he's done. You know, we've seen on HBO just all these guys he's been knocking out, and just. And then he's had a uh, really close fights with Canelo and, and Daniel Jacobs. That's why I don't have him higher. He's in. He's been in basically back-to-back draws, you know. Or he, you could make a case he arguably won both of those fights. You can make a case he arguably lost. Either way, they're two very close fights. Uh, I feel like the other guys have fought better level, you know, opposition. Um, him, if you look at his resume, I think the two best guys would be Daniel Jacobs and Canelo. Um, and so then Jared Hurd, we just see him, seen him beat the guy at 154, or, or at least one of the top guys in Ares Landy Laura, and it helped, you know, hell of a fight, right? He's also beat Austin Trout. That's two names, you know, two top 154 pounders. So that's why I have him on the list. Um, you know, he has two belts, and then, uh, Badu Jack at nine. And Badu Jack, I feel like he's very underrated, underappreciated. He's on a crazy streak where he's, I mean, from Butte all the way to Adana Stevenson. He's fought James DeGale. Oh, man. Just Nathan fight Cleverly. after fight. Nathan Cleverly, fight after fight. Fighting top guys. You know, and 
you can make a case he's won all those fights. <laughs> he's had a lot that, of bad decisions, so. And that's so at six or seven straight world champions he fought. Yeah, like he's on an amazing streak. Uh, and then ten, rounding out the pound for pound list, I have Errol Spence. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've already seen what he's done so far. I mean, he's walked through. Chris Algieri, um, Lamont Peterson, Kel Brook. He, Kel Brook and Lamont, I was very uh, – well, I, I shouldn't say surprised, but I should say I was, I was amazed. I was just like, wow, okay, I see you, bro. Okay, yeah, yeah, you are the truth, you know, because Kel Brook was – the the guy at 147, right? You can make, you know, people were saying that. You could arguably say he was the guy. Um, and he went over to went over there to the UK in Kell Brook's backyard and beat him, stopped him. Right. Then Lamont Peterson. You've never seen Lamont Peterson just get whooped. Okay, you you've seen him get stopped before Matisse, yeah. But this this ass whooping was nothing to be seen. Look like he shouldn't even been in the ring with him. And they're smiling. Like he was having fun. I'm like, what is this? So that that's the that's the uh, the 10. Um obviously in the next couple of months, you know, this fall, this winter, a lot of these guys are fighting and we're gonna see a lot of movement. Uh Arrow Spence fighting Mikey, so that's two pop. Uh, top 10 pound for pound guys going at it. Uh, we should see maybe Swift back, J- you know, Jared Hurd. Uh, and I said Swift. Uh, Danny Garcia might be on the pound for pound list. He's fighting Sean Porter. He's a guy that is always overlooked and people want to say cherry picking. And But I don't, I don't really see that as, you know, as, as, as it being true. You know, I, He's fought a lot of really good fighters, you know? Yeah, he yeah. had one, one fight where he fought somebody that maybe he could have fought better competition, right? But everything else was it was okay. It was normal. Yeah. Danny, he gets a lot of just I just I guess it's bad rep, bad news, you know, just people going in on him, but you know, he had his intro fight at 147, which was Pauly. That's not bad, you know. Looked decent in that fight. Um, he had another fight uh, with Brandon Rios. That's to stay busy. Uh, you know, b- before, you know, Sean Porter, and that was okay. Brandon Rios brought it. It wasn't a bad fight. It wasn't like we got a bad version of Brandon Rios. No, he came to fight. And he was he was getting Danny. He was tagging him somewhat, you know. So... I'm okay with it. And you look at all the other fights Danny's had. He's fought the, the very best, the top of, the, you know, of, of each division he's been in. Uh, so I have, I just don't, it doesn't make sense to me that people go in on him. Um, but uh, if you beat Sean Porter, maybe he's creeping in. Maybe he's at 10. You know, if he beats uh, the winner between Mikey and Arrow, Oh man, he's now he's what top five, right? Top seven. Well, I'll, I'll make a case for him just based on what you said. Out of all the guys currently on the list, he's defeated more world champions than anyone on that list. Oh, for sure, for sure. So yeah. that alone, I mean, should put him up there. And his only defeat came against a unification bout with Keith Thurman, who was undefeated. And the naturally mm-hmm. bigger fighter. So, and it was a close decision. It could have been scored a draw, a split in his favor. It happened to be a split in Thurman's favor. So, I don't think the public or the boxing community should penalize Danny Garcia for losing a closely contested, con- I'm sorry, closely contested split decision fight against an undefeated fighter. Yeah. And then he had his little hiccup in Puerto Rico with Mauricio Herrera. Okay. At the time, Mauricio Herrera was a top top five 140 pounder. 
Yeah. You know? And I think with a lot of these lists, the, the, the respective parties who create their list, they have to really look at the true meaning of pound for pound and look at the, the metrics you're supposed to rank the pound for pound fighters by. It's supposed to be based on their resume, you know, who they're fighting. Are they fighting the best in their division? Are they fighting top 15, top 10, top five contenders, fellow champions? You want to look at their performance in these fights. How do they look in the fights? Are they dominant? Is it a close victory? Did they really lose but were awarded the decision? Did they showcase different skills, different elements to their game? You know, there's also the um, the element of just like the skills in itself. Like, what is it that makes this fighter different from everyone else? You know, Terrence Crawford, for example, is a switch hitter. He's highly effective of switching from orthodox to southpaw. He gives you various, diff- you know, various angles. He throws different types of punches. Uh, Mikey Garcia is known for his timing and mastery of distance. I mean, there's different things uh, that, you know, separate fighters and establish them as pound for pound fighters. So we have to keep that in mind. You know, people may have some kind of backlash for you not having Gennady Golovkin as like your number one guy. And I don't even have him on my, on my top pound for pound list if i had him on there it would be maybe nine or ten and that's just based on his lack of a resume and the skills i mean he's skilled obviously and a talented fighter but he, over the other fighters that we've mentioned and some other fighters who aren't even on the list he doesn't really his accomplishments don't dwarf them so that's what people need to keep in mind when looking at pound for pound fighters yeah right And, you know, everyone's list is different as well. Um, you know, there's so many different places you can go for a pound for pound list, ESPN, Transnational. I mean, the ring. The ring, yeah, just so many. Um, but, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, I just wanted to say, uh, everyone, um, you know, follow uh, the KO Corner at um, – Z underscore KO underscore corner on Instagram. Uh, you can follow us on uh, Twitter as well at uh, KO corner. And, um, and it's, you know, just keep, keep listening. You know, we're going to keep giving you, bringing you this uh, content, you know, having different people come on as well. Uh, there's two other KO corner members you haven't heard from, and uh, you will definitely hear from them in the future. And they, they bring a lot to the table as well. Um, Definitely. Yeah. You know, they, they all have their views. They're, they're not just like us, you know. <laughs> That's why I, I like our, you know, this group. Uh, you know, KO Corner is just we're all different. So uh, you'll get their point of views on fights and, and fighters and, list and all types of stuff so yeah just um keep listening keep tuning in yeah and i'll just add one thing the one thing that we all have in common is we love boxing so there will never be a dispute about that we love the sport and we want to see the sport grow and we want the best for the sport so for sure. as my partner said just keep listening and it's going to continue to hear more wonderful things about the ko corner and about boxing from this channel For sure, for sure. And, you know, this is KO Corner, and we're signing out. The podcast you just heard was published with Anchor. Got something you want to say to the creator of this show? Send them a voice message using the Anchor app, free for iOS and Android.